topic is grit, resilience, and the efficacy of wilderness therapy. And when I say wilderness therapy, I mean very specifically the traditional wilderness therapy, the, the model that we use, the, the primitive living nomadic model. And, and there's been such a, um, a, a direction change for uh, uh, these kinds of programs over in, in the last 10 years where they're adding a lot of adventure and, and recreation and a lot of base camp models. And at Evoke, we tend to, to stick with this because we believe in it. We think those other avenues market well to, to maybe people might feel guilty or afraid or anxious about the, the difficulty, the challenge of a primitive living nomadic wilderness therapy. But I want to show you some outcomes tonight, which are really exciting to share about um, how we fare compared to many of those models. In addition, I want to talk about grit, which is kind of a hot new word, and resiliency, um, which has been around for some time as, as a hot new word, and, and to talk about how they really are fostered by this kind of model. So welcome to the broadcast. Very happy to be doing it this evening. First and foremost, I want to talk about grit. That's the kind of new word on the scene, very similar to resilience. And it's based on the work by Angela Lee Duckworth, who, who's a researcher who started to observe in the classroom that there was a difference between uh, the, the way that children fared, and it wasn't explained by their IQ, that many of her most successful students weren't necessarily her brightest. And so she went back to school and she started to, to look into this research. She looked into cadets at West Point at the military academy. She looked at teachers in rough areas where they had rough demographics, difficult schools and populations. She looked at students and their graduation rates in Chicago. And she started to measure grit and started to see what kind of correlation that was to being successful. How long were the students going to be at at West Point, were they going to graduate? How long were they going to graduate? What was going to be the graduation correlation with the students? How long were these teachers, were they going to stay in their school for a year or longer? And she started to notice that it was very well predicted by grit. She designed, defined grit in these ways. It's a passion and a perseverance for a very long-term goal. It's stamina. It's sticking with your future day to day, day in and day out for years and working hard. So staying focused, working on your future, your, your goals, your objective. And she said it, it can be very, very, uh, an analogy can be that we live life like it's a marathon and not like a sprint, not easily set back, not easily dismayed, not easily disillusioned. And, 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 and do we give up on what we're, uh, what we're searching for? She saw in, in her studies that talent, like I said, with the IQ, with the suits, talent, did not relate to grit. But there were a lot of people in these various areas that were very talented, charismatic, gifted, intelligent, but if they didn't have grit, they were more likely to not accomplish the tasks, the measures that she was, she was talking about. She also borrows on the work, and I'm gonna talk about Dr. Carol Dweck this evening from Stanford University about this idea of growth mindset, this idea that the brain can change that we're not necessarily born with math brains, that we're not necessarily born with something that, that's fixed, that, that can't change. And so I'm going to talk about that research tonight, something I've shared before, something that's in the, the webinar, the broadcast, and the book Nurture Shock, but I think very, really exciting. And what's exciting about it also is they've started to test this growth mindset versus fixed mindset with pro-social behaviors, right? Emotional what we would consider emotionally healthy behaviors. What they found was teaching kids about how the brain changes increases the likelihood of perseverance. Right? It's a, it's a pretty simple idea that I think resonates with most of us, that if we believe that we can develop in a certain area, and then we believe that there's science behind that, then we're more likely to stick with it. If we believe that we're born with it or not, failure, setbacks, discouraging efforts are going to more likely lead to quitting. She talks about this idea that, that failure is part of a successful journey. It's one of the things that I talk about with parents and have for, for decades. This idea that we learn to value the failures, the setbacks, you know, the, the two steps back in the process. And when parents can start to do that and, and stop thinking about it kind of as pass or fail, good and bad, we see the family change their perspective. It changes 
all the psychology that happens between a parent and a child, it makes the child feel differently about themselves. But if we're rigid, afraid, most likely coming from a, a trauma in our life, right? We're protecting against failures and then setbacks. We create a, an anxiety, a, a need for perfection. And we do that with ourselves as well as our children. It's a culture that we develop in our home. She talks about being willing as researchers to, to fail and be wrong. In other words, she said, we need grit to study grit. And, and, and something I, I really like that she said, she said that it's really important that we understand that when we set out to do something, we're going to challenge our preconceived ideas. When we're, when we're going to study grit, we have to look at those things in our life that we just take for granted. I've shared with you many times the profound moment that a parent shared with me. Many have, really. But when one parent said to me very clearly, I found in my work with Evoke, this is the parent talking, I found in my work, my parenting work with Evoke, that when one of my closely held assumptions, what, what I discovered to be wrong or, or erroneous, I realized everything was up for grabs. And at first it was frightening. I was overwhelmed. But then, of course, down the road, everything opened up for this person. And they found a whole new sensibility, a whole new way of living. Resilience, the idea of resiliency has been around a little bit longer than, than grit in the pop psychology world and, and in the research world. Um, but they're, they're very synonymous. Um, when we talk about re resilience, I think about it in terms of how it relates to a sense of self. I talk about this all the time, that one of the things that we see with kids that are coming into outpatient and inpatient settings, especially from affluent families, where there's lots of opportunity, we're seeing depression, anxiety, self-harm, suicidality, substance use, eating disorders, on and on, that, that we can't easily explain by an environment that seems traumatic. But what there is in these environments sometimes is a focus on outcomes, right? A focus on accomplishments instead of a focus on self. So the shift becomes, as I've been talking about for the last few months on these broadcasts, the shift becomes shifting away from raising a, a successful student to raising a healthy self. So what is a self? A self is simply who we are. It's how we feel. If I feel angry and I'm connected to that, right? Having a healthy self means that I'm in touch with my feelings. I'm in touch with who I am. I'm in touch with, I know what I like and what I don't like, what I'm willing to do and not willing to do, what my goals are, what my values are, what my desires are, what my preferences are. In other words, you ask me a question about me, and if I have a well-developed sense of self, I can more aptly answer that. And there's no, nobody with a perfect or, or completely whole self but we think about the battle that we have inside of our brain, right? All the noise that's inside of our brains, all the shoulds, all the musts, all the have to, all the expectations, all the shameful dialogues we have in our brain. Those are all barriers or clouds over the sense of self versus somebody who says, I know what I like. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is what I'm willing to do and not do. This is what I want to become. I don't like broccoli, right? I like to go to baseball games. I don't like football games. I like Baroque music. I don't like Renaissance music. On and on and on. So that's what a self is. And, and how do we foster a sense of self? It has to start first with a base for a parent of some sense of self, right? And that is why I've said for many years now, People will talk about the work that we do at Evoke, the, the parent curriculum, the work that I share. And they'll, they'll say to me, well, that's your training, right? That's because of your training. You're educated. And, and what I've shared with people is most of what I have to offer, if there is, whatever I have to offer that has any value to, to it, doesn't come principally from my academic and professional training. It comes from my therapeutic work. It comes from the fact that as a client, I've walked into a therapist's office over and over and over again and done battle with that noise inside of my head. So that when I'm sitting with you, parents, I'm with you, right? We're in this together. You're not alone. We're all doing this, this battle together. And I can resonate with you because I've, I've been seen. I've been held. I've gone to a place where it was safe for me to explore 
all of that, even the, the craziest, most neurotic parts of myself. Next, we get to the place of attachment, right? Healthy attachment, which again comes from this healthy base of self and a parent. And it's this ability to, to see the child as an other, right? To see what they need, what they're feeling, to be able to hold it, to, to, to contain it is the, is the word in therapy, which means to give it space, to sit with their pain, their disappointment and anger, to understand it, not at the level that it compromises our self and our space and our circle, right? I think that's where people get confused. They think they have to sacrifice themselves in the process of containing, and that's not true. That's abandoning self. That's over-identifying with the child. So we learn to see, to value the whole self in the child, including the pain, the neuroses, the struggle, the insanity, the, the failure, all of it. I don't mention the positive traits because I think for many of us, that's not a challenge. It's not a challenge to see the quote unquote good parts of the child and hold space for that. But we are challenged as parents to hold space for the quote unquote bad parts or crazy parts or irrational parts. When if we can come to understand the child, they can more, uh, they, they can better develop uh, themselves in the process. Let's talk about uh, Dr. Carol Dweck from, from Stanford University and her work. You can go to, to the, the website Mindset. Um, in fact, there's a spelling error there. It should just say MindsetWorks.com. You can go there um, if you'd like to. Maybe you can type that in the, in the chat for everybody to see. Take out the, the, the O that's in the middle of it between the T and the W. Dr. Dweck uh, coined the terms fixed mindset and growth mindset to describe the underlying beliefs people have about learning and intelligence. When students believe they can get smarter, they understand that efforts make them stronger. Therefore, they put in extra time and effort, and it leads to higher achievement. They actually, in her curriculum, I've sat in on a presentation of hers, they actually substitute math education, they take away math education time, and they substitute activities around teaching children about the growth mindset. Experiential activities, educational activities, instruction and education about the brain. And then at the end of these, these blocks of curriculum, they test them. And the children with, with the mindset, the, the growth mindset curriculum do better. That, that's incredible. They actually have less instruction in math. And they do better because they learn about how the brain can grow and is malleable, is plastic, and can change. Seventh graders who were taught that intelligence is malleable and showing how the brain grows with effort showed a clear increase in math grades. One example, and there, there are many, many studies. This is what I thought was fascinating. She started off with, with math, uh, but now they're, they're, they're expanding the research. In addition to the academic ability, students may develop a fixed mindset about their personal characteristics. Jaeger and colleagues found that students who participated in a six session intervention about the malleability, malleability of the their personality traits behave less aggressively and more pro-socially. This research demonstrates that we can change students' mindsets in non-academic areas and make an impact on a range of behaviors. I think that's powerful. This is kind of leading into the idea of the efficacy of wilderness therapy. First of all, having this in our homes, having this in, in our own minds, thinking about it, talking about it this way, Praising children on effort versus praising children on giftedness. That's, that's explained very clearly in the book Nurture Shock. And, and you can go back to that podcast or broadcast if you'd like to. Um, but we can do that around other personality traits. I have a couple of slides here that show it. When they're given the, the, the growth curriculum, the, their GPA increases, math grades increase. Um, students who were, uh, excuse me, I skipped one. Um, the impact of praise on performance after a failure. So in other words, if you praise intelligence, giftedness, there, uh, the number of problems solved goes down. If you praise effort, something that's inside of their control, it goes up. I saw a video by, by many of Dweck's uh, graduates and, and many of them were identified early in their academic careers 
as gifted. And all of them talked about overwhelming anxiety and, and the, the impulse to quit when it got difficult for them or, or when they had some failure. So I think that's really profound. And then, of course, sharing with you the, the, this idea, this chart about that when children were taught about their ability of the brain to change as it relates to personality characteristics, that there was an increase in pro-social, the, the pro-social measure that they used versus the aggressive. So I think that's really, really powerful stuff. And you can read more about it on, on, on the website. Another thing when we think about challenge and versus the recreation, the adventure model of the base camp model. A quote from Thomas Edison, opportunity is missed by most people because it's dressed in overalls and looks like work. You know, our model, what we do, it's, a, it's an incredible model. We have lots of students who come back to work for us. Right? We, we have incredible outcomes that I'll share with you in just a moment. But the fact of the matter is there's a shift in culture that's impacting the treatment industry, right? It ought not to be that way. It's the tail wagging the dog. There's a shift in culture that, that people are replacing work with recreation, right? We, we can understand that. We can all have empathy for it. Anybody who has raised a child can have empathy for that shift because it, it's kind of the any port in the storm parenting. We're all exhausted. This is hard work. This is challenging. Dealing with difficult behaviors, difficult emotions in children is exhausting. So we're tempted to, to placate them to some degree. Recreation works because everybody is happy. Parents feel less stress, guilt, or personal discomfort. Parents protecting against failure and struggle, right? This idea that, that we don't want children and we think of children experience a setback that their self-esteem will be deemed. Really, when really we're just putting an emphasis in the wrong area for self-esteem instead of giftedness and aptitude being fixed, we said it in, in perseverance and in grit and resiliency. Parents not allowing children to be angry with them. I put an asterisk by that because I think that that phrase, parents not allowing children to be angry with them, I think it can be too simplistic. I think it's one of the things that pop psychologists and some therapists will use to insult parents. And I want to say it in a more compassionate way, right? You know, part of our work, part of what I've taught in our curriculum is that we learn to listen to our children. We learn to see them. We learn to be flexible in our parenting. And to do that, we're going to listen to their anger, right? And we may adjust. That's part of the curriculum. So, again, it has to start with this stable base. And if it comes from a fundamentally wounded place in us about needing to be liked, not having enough of a sense of self in, in ourselves that we can withstand the tantrums, right? The anger, the sadness, the, dis the disappointment in our children. And I would say in my experience, everybody struggles with that some. And so it's, I, I want to say it more compassionately, but it, it is a dynamic that we learn to develop enough. Uh, we, we get our esteem from somewhere else. So that we sh when we show up in the parenting relationship, we can show up clear. And still flexible, but clear. So, how does this all relate to, to, to wilderness therapy? The pure wilderness therapy that, I, that I'm talking about, the Matic model that is shrinking, is the outcome. You have the out Outdoor Behavioral Health Cooperative, right? That's, that's a, a bunch of programs that call themselves wilderness therapy that, that come together to... to gather data to look at outcomes. And they use principally, they use some other measures, but they use principally the outcome questionnaire, which measures progress over time in therapy, right? It's a, it's a measure that you can take repeatedly and measures progress or change. The YOQ is for uh, the youth under 18, and the OQ is for adult, and then there's one for parents. And we have the outdoor behavioral health data, which does include to evoke programs, right? It includes because we participate. So our data is in there also. And then we have our own data because we've been doing outcome research longer than virtually anybody. We've, been, we've contributed to the data uh, in, in profound ways for many, many years. And I would credit my, my partner, Dr. Matt Hoy, who has led the research, and my other partner, Rick Heiser, 
who has been a proponent of this work, who also happens to be the chairman on, on the Outdoor Behavioral Health Council right now. But let's talk about the outcomes, okay? There's a slide for those of you that are watching the webinar. Um, for those of you that are listening, you can, you can ask for the slides, and I'm, I'm happy to share this with you. But I'm, I'm going to share, and I'll try to read them slowly, some of the main conclusions from the research and comparing overall the outcomes of wilderness therapy programs, including ours, we're in that data, to the research that we've done just ourselves. First point, parents and clients report staying healthier at six months and 12 months after evoke compared to after the average outdoor behavioral health, health member program. Outdoor behavioral health programs clients report a 27 point change by both adults and adolescents and parents report a 58 point change compared to a vote where adult clients report a 26 point change and adolescents report a 36 point change. That's amazing. That's amazing difference. And parents report a 65 point change, nearly double. Parents report from admission to discharge nearly double the improvement when we look at our data compared to the general pro pro programs. Both adolescents and parents report significantly greater changes. The youth outcome questionnaire defines reliable change. So there's change in, in research and then there's reliable change, something that's significant statistically. The youth outcome questionnaire defines reliable change as a drop of 13 points for parents or 18 points for adolescents and 14 points for young adults. So, so both have reliable change, but ours are in some cases are a, a full uh, measure of, above the others. Evoke clients and parents report a 30% greater amount of change than the average OBH program. So in other words, our clients are reporting a 30% improvement over that of the average OBH program. I reported 36 and 65 point change respective while, while at a vote. It's amazing. And then this is kind of the thing that, that brings the earlier concepts that I was talking about and this outcome, what, what makes it relevant. Only about one third of OBH programs utilize the nomadic model. All others include base camps and or adventure activities. Some resemble wilderness therapy very, very little. Some because of the adventure activities, they spend a tremendous amount of time in a car traveling. These add-ons make the OBH experience either easier in the consideration of base camps or more fun when considering adventure activities. Both of these things may rob clients of the opportunity to develop greater resilience or grit. I would also say our emphasis on parent work may also be a part of that change. Not only the impact that a parent's work has on the child, but also a parent's perspective, right? The new eyes and new ears that comes as you do this work. And, and I can tell you officially, and this is me tooting our own horn, that when you ask therapeutic programs off the record, when you ask them about who is, is best prepared, evoke therapy programs and other programs that use the primitive living nomadic model are, are commonly at the top of their report. And then you talk about the parents being prepared and evoke therapy programs is often at the top of their list of programs. So. I think that's powerful. So first, the take home is we have to develop grit ourselves, right? We have to do our own work. We have to develop a sense of ourselves. We have to process and work through our own trauma. We have to do battle with that conversation that goes on inside of all of our heads. We have to look and find our wounds and find out how they impact us. We have to develop a sense of self, which in my way of thinking, can only be developed in relationship to somebody else. Uh, it can be a group, a support group. It can be a, a therapist. It can be somebody that can, can hold us and see us. Kind of provide that attachment wound reparative work. Seeing the other, in other words, the child, seeing the other as an other requires a self. Right? It is the fundamental work that we are asked to do. It is what your child's issues 
that led to your enrollment at Evoke, it is what that asks of you. The development of self, which leads to, which puts you in the starting block, uh, in the capacity to be able to see them and to relate to them. To learn to see failures, struggles, challenges, and negative feelings as okay, as a part of the journey. In the, in the broad perspective, in the big picture, it is to say that evoke, that, that enrollment at evoke, that the problem, and no matter where you are, if you're post evoke and struggling, that that's all part of the journey, part of the education, part of the lesson, part of the curriculum of life, that there's value in it. And when we look at it that way, we get access, like I always say, to the wisdom, to the treasure, to the gold that that has to offer. And Joseph Campbell's way of thinking, it's the dragon that we're fighting that, that when we make peace with it, or slay the dragon, that's the way some people say it, but really it's making peace with your dragon, that it gives us the treasure that it was hoarding, the treasure that it was hiding. We have to overcome our shame, right? Really, a lot of this, folks, is about getting out of the culture that, that's steering us in a different direction. It's, it's, it's ubiquitous. The culture around us is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. And the assumptions that so many of us are walking around with are so wrong. We know that they have value in evolution, in, 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 in survival, right? Our defenses, our symptoms have value in our survival. It's how we got through life. But then this work, the work of enlightenment, the work of therapy, the work of parent education, the work of evoke, the work of developing grit and resiliency, which are, are centered in this healthy idea of a sense of self, where all parts of us are okay, have value, and where we can grow constantly and change and challenge our, our assumptions. All of that is what this asks of us, what this is asking of you. Fostering a growth mindset. It's something we work on in our family. I was not aware of this, the psychology of this when I had older children, my, with my older children, and even my younger children when they were younger, to constantly pray, praise their efforts, to constantly praise their stick to itiveness, to constantly praise the things they have control over. And even though I could identify in all four of my children a certain kind of giftedness that they seem to be born with, I can do that. Most importantly, that's not going to be the thing that's going to sustain them. Emotionally, psychologically, academically. It's going to be this idea, these ideas of the growth mindset kind of thinking. And then learning to see the whole self rather than just the good parts. It goes back to Carl Jung's idea when he uttered it, when he said, I would rather be whole than good. Right? That short little idea is the essence of therapy. It's the essence of healthy attachment. It's the essence of containing. It's the essence of compassion. Right? And so the stuff that happens out in our primitive living nomadic model is life. It's life with a magnifying glass. It's life amplified. It's challenge, it's disappointment, it's, it's a long life. I had a student one time who had incredible success, more than I would have ever predicted with him. And he attributed it to one difficult hike that became a metaphor for his life. He later went on to do wonderful things and run all, all kinds of races, triathlons, raise money for charities, wonderful things. And he attributed it back to that one moment. It's doing something that's hard. It's when the student comes to evoke and says, I can't. And I simply say to them gently, said this for decades now, I think you're wrong. I think you can. I know it's hard. I'll sit with you in your pain. I'll empathize with you. I might even cry with you. I'll share stories of my pain, my difficulty, my challenges, my mistakes, what I can relate to, and what you're going through. But in the end, I think you can. And even the ones that have struggled phenomenally in our program, I've seen them come to the end, and there's a sense of accomplishment because they did something hard. One student, when asked by a professional touring a program years ago, when this new adventure model was, was up and coming, and the professional said, where did you go to wilderness? He said, oh, I went to such and such. And somebody said, 
well, what's that? He said, it's where you send your children. It's where parents send their children when they're afraid to do the right thing. This is a hard thing. And we have made the choice so far not to let the tail wag the dog and change our model. We believe in it. And the research supports it. So that's my little exciting soapbox for the day. And again, we can borrow those, some of those principles from some of the concepts that we're talking about. And we can, we can adopt them in our own lives, in our own families, see the value of them. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll go on to some of the announcements. If there are any other questions that come in, I'll get those on the last slide. We ask all parents to go to six 12-step support groups, Al-Anon, CODA, or Families Anonymous. You can also go to NAMI.org to find helpful resources in your area and affordable resources. You know, the reason that I call it heroic parenting is because it is heroic. It's hard to do. It's, it's painful. You're doing the kind of work. That's why I thank you for joining these broadcasts, to listening to these broadcasts for and on behalf of your children because you're doing the work that some parents don't want to do. You know, when we first get introduced to this work at Evoke, we say, well, it's not about me. It's about my child. We resist it. There's, there's shame. There, there's, there's guilt about the mistakes we made. And, and then... We get into the work a little bit. We, we find a way to get past that. And then our, our, our world opens up to us. If you want to listen to these broadcasts on the go, you can listen to them on your iPhone or iOS device on the podcast app, on an Android device, on the SoundCloud app, or on your computer, go to soundcloud.com. And all of those platforms, search Evoke Therapy Programs and subscribe there. You can download them, listen to them when you're even out of internet connection. On Twitter and Instagram, follow us at Evoke Therapy. On Facebook, search Evoke Therapy Programs and follow us there. And then the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook is a foundation that you can become involved in or, or, or if you're interested for people who can't afford therapeutic services. They raise money to help people that can't afford it. Our Evoke Therapy blog has, has um, new content all the time. You can buy my book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, on Amazon. Just click on the, the, the paperback option the new paperback option, the warehouse is out of it again right now, and you can buy it there from Evoke Therapy Programs. You can also buy an audio version or a Kindle version on Amazon too. Upcoming intensives, the May 2nd through 6th is closed. The next opening is uh, June 6th through 10th. If you want to do deeper work, you want to do a deep dive into, into finding this self that I've been talking about, a therapy accelerator, a therapy springboard, and in, in my opinion, an incredibly rewarding process that I myself have gone through more than once. Come to our Finding You, June 6th through 10th. Coming soon is Finding You 2. I'll be announcing the date of that soon. For those who want to come, if you want to do a private family intensive, we customize those also. If you're a professional listening to this broadcast in the therapeutic field, we also have professional growth work workshops. The next available workshops are for women, May 20th through 22nd, and, May and for men, June 10th through 12th. To learn more about any of these, go to our website or email intensives at evoketherapy.com. I'll be in New York City on Monday, the 23rd, 7 to 9, at the City University of New York in, in Midtown. In Seattle, we will be, uh, we'll, we'll be hosting, we'll be announcing the location real soon, Saturday, May 12th, 4 to 6 p.m. In Denver, I will be uh, in Denver on May 14th, 7 to 9 p.m. And coming soon is the Bay Area. Email melanie at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. The Entrada Workshop, if you're not signed up now, there would still be time, I imagine, but you're probably not signing. You're probably not going to the April 21st to 22nd at Entrada. Um, we won't be having one in, in May right now. Um, so the next opportunity would be in June on the 23rd and 24th. We want all families that can come to a workshop while the child is with us to come with us. You could also combine that with a visit to your child if your therapist, if their therapist says that the timing is right. Contact Gail at evoketherapy.com for more information or to RSVP. Pursuits trips are adventure activities, short trips for families and um, young adults. Think therapy light. Think uh, sober fun. Something you can do as a family. Happy to take any live questions that have come in. Our son is resistant to even talking about his wilderness experience at Evoke as if it is a trauma. So we tread very lightly on remembering this life-changing experience, at least for us as parents. We are, two, two year, we are two years out and still listening to podcasts. I feel disappointed that he does not speak 
of it positively with the outcome, outcome successes you speak of. What can I do with this? Just let go? Is there nothing more to do to challenge him to acknowledge the experience, the amazing experience we gave him? That's a great question. And, and what I would say simply is absolutely let go. E even so far as to say, I'm sorry, maybe it wasn't right for you. And I want to hear more about it. I, I think what can happen is the tension occurs when you want him to like it, to accept it, to value it, to acknowledge the value that it was. And he wants to be heard about how hard it was, how, how angry he was, how sad it was, how scary it was at times. And it was all those things, I'm sure. And, and what I know, and I've had students like this, graduates of my group like this, what I know is I remember the, the time when they talked about that it was the safest and best place in their life. And we have to give place for their anger, their fear, their sadness, their grief, the loss that's there too. So yes, the idea is to let go. To not to, to do your best to let go of any investment you have in him getting to the place that you want to, and even to the point where you acknowledge that maybe it was wrong for him, and you're sorry that it hurt him. And, and when you acknowledge all of him in that way, he's much more likely to then say, it wasn't all bad, and I did like my therapist, and here's what I got out of it that I still use in life. Our daughter with a learning disability, another parent writes, is trying very hard to overcome the disability but seems, but sees no change after many years and has become depressed. How do you foster resiliency when she has abandoned the belief that more hard work can make a difference? I think that's a challenge. I mean, we do all come with liabilities and, and, and resources, right? Not every brain is the change. Um, you know, what, what I would, I would encourage you to go to the growth mindset website that I mentioned, mindsetworks.com, and start to read the literature. They even have a Facebook page. And start to read about it. Start to read about kinds of education, educating her about how the brain works and develops. You know, some of the greatest, most gifted humans that have ever walked on the planet had learning differences, right? And there are some things in my own learning that I'm not very good at compared to everybody else. And we learn different ways, and we learn to work around, to accommodate. So... I think there's shame there, there's stigma, there's this idea that she should be like everybody else, that, that she's not gifted in certain areas, and, and because of that, something's wrong with her. So there's a, there's a therapeutic shame piece there, and the growth mindset can help. And so therapy can help, right? right? Nobody, nobody, none of us are measured by our elbows, right? Nobody ever says to you, you have a really handsome or sexy elbow. You have a very attractive elbow. Nobody ever says that to us, right? But people are valued for other body parts, for how they look, for their talent in singing, for their intelligence, right? And in therapy, when, when we do this kind of therapy that I'm describing, you just learn that everybody's different and that everybody's beautiful in their own way, right? Ram Dass talks about this idea that we walk into the forest and we see fat trees, skinny trees, broken trees, bent over trees, Trees with no leaves, trees with lots of leaves. We see all this variety, all the differences in the trees, and we just call it beautiful. Then we walk out of a forest, we walk into a city, and we see fat people, skinny people, tall people, short people, people bent over, people with no legs, people that can't see, and we start to have all kinds of judgments about it. So therapy or enlightenment, this idea of seeing the whole self, of developing this capacity that starts with our, us, that's the antidote. But it takes a long time to unlearn the shame, to unlearn the ideas about good and right and beauty. So therapy, the growth mindset, and be patient with it. And then sit and hold space for her and listen and understand. And even with her, when she's in a hole, you get down in the hole with her. You understand it. You empathize. You don't try to take her out of it. Right? You get under the bus with her. And you feel what she feels, and it's hard. And yet you, 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 you try to connect to that, to understand it. That's what I would say. All right, looks like there's no other questions. I'm going to be doing a webinar next Wednesday, the 25th, at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. I believe it's on uh, nutrition and, and mindfulness in the wilderness. So I didn't write that down because I didn't have that in time, but that's what I believe it's about. Nutrition and mindfulness in, in the wilderness. So 
That broadcast will be Wednesday, April 25th. Thank you, as always, for showing up. Thank you for doing your work for and on behalf of your child. Thank you for your heroic parenting, the willingness to look at yourself in this process, to look at your participation, contribution to all of this. It's an incredible gift to your child, and I thank you for and on behalf of them. And um, hope you have a great week, and I'll talk to you next Monday. See some of you in New York. Take care. Bye-bye.